Let your verdict. Give us the answer. Let's start with your childhood, sir. You grew up in Nagpur. Yes. Could you uh, tell us a little more about your times in Nagpur, early education? Yeah. Oh, well, Nagpur is a good small town, at least when I grew up there. And uh, my father was a chartered accountant, but we come from a family of lawyers. My uncles were lawyers. Well, I mean, one of my closest friends in school, with uh, whom we virtually grew up, his father was also a lawyer then went on to become the Advocate General of Maharashtra, Mr. Bobde. In fact, my friend is right now sitting judge in Bombay. Okay. So, uh, a lot of exposure to this, but uh, it was a nice leisurely life, relatively leisurely. And uh, things were very different. It was a small town, we used to walk to school. It was a nice missionary school. Completely different set of values in which we grew up. There was no TV till we passed school, okay. although some of the big cities had it. So, perforce, we got into the habit of reading and uh, those kind of things. So, it was a very enjoyable childhood. And I feel somehow, I mean, my children grew up, were born in Delhi, grew up in Delhi. And there are a lot of advantages of growing up in a big city, the kind of exposure you get. But sometimes I also feel that there is a... There are some things, some advantages of growing up in a small town which you don't have in a big town. There, in fact, sometimes there are too many distractions in a big city which you don't have. Like, for example, our holidays in Nagpur, where we, I remember when we passed our college, for example, we, three of us friends got into a car and went driving into the uh, forests of uh, that area, to the Western Ghats. Every time on a weekend, our idea of partying was uh, running, uh, getting into a jeep and driving off into some remote place. And of course, you would sneak your bottle of beer or your bottle of rum and go and have fun there on the weekend. But that made you very close to the environment. So, f f enjoyment meant going into some picturesque spot, and spending a night, going and staying somewhere where there is no toilet, where there is no facilities. So you're in the forest. You're going in the morning, sleeping outside, stuff like that. So, that added a lot of charm to life. Is that behind your great passion for forests? Forests were a way of life for us and we sort of grew up. And the interesting thing uh, is, uh, my father was an avid uh, shikari. Okay. And one of his uh, friends and clients was uh, a former minister, Mr. Vidyacharan Shukla, who used to run a shikar company. Alvin Cooper. So, and a lot of his friends were shikaris. And I remember as a little kid, I even got my, there's even a photograph of me sitting on the bonnet of a jeep uh, next to the uh, carcass of a tiger, okay. whom these people had shot. Mm. But having said that, for some reason, by the time we were 14, 15, we gave up any kind of shikar. We had friends with whom once and once or twice we went hunting. But uh, we had turned conservationists. And one of my friends who was uh, the biggest shikari of all of us, is he owned a lot of guns, God bless him, he's no more, he died last year. Who was one of the biggest shikaris, Feroz Patel, and who owned a lot of weapons and stuff like that. In fact, turned a staunch conservationist and he was a part of the uh, WWF. And till, uh, till he died, he used to sort of keep egging me on and you know coming with projects saying we are doing this and we must do that and stuff like that. So you started professional life as a chartered accountant. Take us a little bit uh, through your experiences as a chartered accountant, your shift to law and uh, I've also heard a lot about your uh, great interest in tax law. When I was in 5th, 6th, 7th class I used to, I wanted to be an engineer but soon that idea fell off somewhere along the way when I started reading the Perry Mason novels. <laughs> in any case, by the time uh, I grew up, I was pretty keen on chartered accountancy. And my father had a firm, so I joined chartered accountancy. And uh, my father, being a chartered accountant, had virtually given up, even before he joined politics, had virtually given up all uh, accounting work, which his partners used to look after. And he did exclusively, he did taxation work which brought him in very close contact with Mr. Palkiwala, 
and Mr. Palkewala virtually was like a mentor even for him in his tax work. So we heard the name of Mr. Palkewala from a very young age and I remember meeting Mr. Palkewala for the first time when I was 10 years old. He came to our house in Nagpur and my father had got him to Nagpur to argue some case. So you know, you were a part of that world. I remember meeting Ashok Sen when I was 16 years of age, who had come to Nagpur to argue a case where my father was instructing him in the high court. So I saw all this happening uh, in front of me. So you naturally get become a part of it. And uh, while doing charter accountancy, I realized that it was, accountancy is very boring. And I enjoyed taxation thoroughly. And uh, I sort of drifted into towards tax. And then I realized if I have to do taxation, might as well do it as a lawyer. And the turning point in uh, my career came where the die was cast. It was in 1975. I remember we had just, I had just passed BCom and I had already finished uh, two years of uh, training as an article. And uh, I was preparing for my CA inter exam when uh, one, of her, one of my father's clients had a problem, some interpretational issue under the new set of provisions relating to the settlement commission. And I used to work that time under my father's partner in Nagpur because my father was mostly in Delhi. And it was a very complex question and he told me, he says, prepare a note. So I prepared a note and uh, uh, my father came from Delhi for a visit and then the meeting was called. And My father's partner took this note which was meant for his eyes and went and showed it to my father and said, this is the note. And my father read the note and I was petrified. I was very scared of my father and I was petrified that I would be humiliated in front of everyone by saying, you know, which idiot has made this note. He read it and he growled at, my, at his junior partner saying, who has prepared this note? So to get rid of it, he says, he pointed towards me. And my father said, very interesting. And he says, but the point which you raised, he says, uh, I was in the committee which drafted this law, but we never looked at it this way. And there was some question about definition of case. and They went, meant it in a particular way, but the way I read it, it was different. And he says, what you are saying sounds plausible. But the stakes were very high. So he said, let us go and take Mr. Palkiwala's opinion on this. And as a reward for having made that note, I didn't get a fee, of course. I was still training, but I got an air ticket to go to Bombay okay. and a hotel room to stay, which was my first professional visit on my own steam. And we went to have a meeting with Mr. Palkiwala. When he read that note, and my father, of course, with great pride, said, Harish is my name. So he looked at me and smiled and said, and when are you joining the profession? That was it as far as I am concerned. Okay. And where did you do your uh, legal education? I did my law from Nagpur. Okay. And uh, then in 78, I moved I was in and out of Nagpur, but I did my law from Nagpur. Then I qualified. Then I joined Dadasan G and Company. So I used to partly intern with them in Delhi, partly do law in Nagpur. Fortunately, the college is not too keen on attendance, so one managed. And then 78, uh, we finished our law and then I moved to Delhi. Full time with the Chanji and Company for two years. But I kept my degree back because my father still wanted me to continue the charity account. Then, then I, some practical work to finish. So I finished that and then 18, I formally qualified, although 78 we had finished. And then in 1980, I formally qualified and joined immediately. And Mr. Palkewala then told me, you join solely. So in fact, he spoke to uh, Mr. Sorabji and Mrs. Sorabji and said, you must take this youngster. In the meanwhile, I had a great uh, opportunity. In 78 December, when Mr. Palkewala argued Minerva Mills, okay. I was with Dachanji and Company that time. So I was assigned by Mr. Dachanji to assist Mr. Palkewala. And what an opportunity that was. Tell us a little more about Mr. Palkewala. I've never seen a human being that tall. Forget the lawyer in him. I mean, as a lawyer, he was amazing. I've done so many cases with him. I've done tax cases with him. And the way he read a section, you went to him with a question, he read the section and you said, I don't need your answer, you've already answered it. So that, that was his capacity of analysis and his expression was marvellous. 
His skills, forensic skills were amazing. His advocacy skills were amazing. I mean, I noticed, I was young then, I noticed one thing very interesting. When he was arguing Minerva Mills, he put a proposition of law. And get resistance from the judges. So he sort of get into his rhetoric and whip up the emotional side. And bring up and, you know, Gokhale's infamous speech about the court being a let and a hindrance. He'd get everybody's adrenaline flowing. And he put the same point of law and bang on, <laughs> it went in. So I said, wow, yeah, this is an amazing skill. I got to know him personally very well. Because after 1980, I did a number of matters with him. The famous Loya Machines case, which we argued in 1983, we worked together. And then I saw the personal side of Mr. Palkewala. And uh, my wife, he was very fond of my wife. And he visited our home. I mean, I was a young lawyer that time, but I invited him for dinner. He says, of course, I'll come. So he came for dinner and then when he, we were in Bombay, he called me over. And I must tell you what a man he was. We were appearing together in the income tax tribunal. I was appearing with him in a case for uh, the Singhanias, Raymond Mills. And he passed a slip to me. And I said, yes, sir, that is fine. And the solicitor leaned over and said, what is it? I said, no, Nani wanted some book and I told him it is here. The truth is he had passed me a slip saying, will Minakshi drink sherry? <laughs> or will she have something else? And I said, no, that is fine. I mean, he is arguing a case on a complex point and he is worried about what drink he is going to offer my wife in the evening. That was the, that was the human being in him. And the first time we visited his house, so what an experience it was. We were sitting in his, he had a little terrace kind of a thing with a lot of greenery. And he told me, he says, I would have loved to call you for dinner, but uh, I'm going out. So you must come for a drink. I said, okay. So we went and sat down there and there was a bottle of Black Dog and a bottle of Black Label and a bottle of Sherry kept. And then his servant came and kept some French cheese and biscuits. And five minutes later, Mr. Palkhevala came, he was in the shard, and he came and sat down next to us. And he picked, he would always pour the drink. So he picked up the bottle of Black Dog and said, Harish, I remember you are telling me you like smoky whiskeys. And I said, sir. And he said, this is a nice whiskey, try this. So he poured me, and he used to pour generous portions. So he poured me a drink, he poured my wife a glass of sherry, he poured himself a small whiskey, and he sat down. And he's talking to us, and he was an amazing conversationalist, you know, full of stories, full of anecdotes. And he pulled the plates towards himself. So he's talking to us, and he's opened the cheese, he's opened the crackers, he's put the cheese on the cracker. And the next thing I know is the cracker is here, <laughs> next to my mouth. And there was a question of saying no to Nani. You know. And I think between my wife and me, he fed us that whole platter of crackers and cheese. But that was the affection of the man. You know. Then after that, many times he went to his house for dinner. And invariably, he'd seat you at the head of the table. He'd never sit at the head of the table. He'd seat you at the head of the table. He always served my wife himself. He always poured the drink. And when we left, he would come out, not only open his flat door, he would call for the elevator. He would come down with us. Once when I was staying at the Oberoi, he walked us to the Oberoi. Once or once or twice when I had a car, I'd call for the car, he would open the car door. And the third or fourth time when this happened, I was so overwhelmed. That, you know, and we were getting into the car and I just, I, I virtually got tears in my eyes and I said, sir, I, I can't even thank you. And my wife also, you know, she was overwhelmed. And she said, sir, I, 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 we don't even know what to say. So he pulled my cheek and said, uh, you don't have to say anything to me. You know, when I first saw your husband, at that time, he was this much above sea level. <laughs> He's a very dear friend's son. He's like my own child. This was the man. And I've learned humility, lessons of humility, lessons of what a human being should be. We can only aspire to be something like that. So about your initial years at the Supreme Court, you worked at the chambers of Sori Sarabji. Um, what do you think about the system of mentorship at the Supreme Court? Soli always had juniors and he was a marvellous senior. When I went first to interview, well, for, for an interview, he's, in his Parsi Marathi, he told me, 
तेल काढ़ीन में तो जाए टेक ऑयल सर्ट ऑफ स्क्वीज ऑयल आउट ऑफ यू एंड आई रिप्लाई टू एम इन मराठी काला साहब पुष्कर है प्लीज गो एट देर लॉट्स ऑफ ऑयल टू टेक आउट ही वॉज ट्रू टू इज वर्ल्ड ही वॉक यू टू द बॉन्ड बट इट वॉज अ ग्लोरियस एक्सपीरियंस वर्किंग विथ हिम ही वॉज अ फ्रेंड वी शेयर अ पैशन फॉर जैज एंड he was amazing and he was always willing to hear that maybe he is thinking wrong he was always willing to hear that maybe you had a good point so he was not one of those intellectuals as who sort of put his juniors down i mean he was short tempered he, he could never any even now you can't suffer fools but having said that if he respected you and he always had immense affection and respect for me he was he was fantastic i mean there have been juniors who sort of left because they couldn't handle his pace and his uh, is and solely worked at a hard pace worked at a fast pace if he pushed you hard he pushed himself hard and it's it's always fantastic when you're training with somebody who pushes you hard because that brings the best out of you and conversations with him i was telling you always had to be staccato you know very short on patience so you have to if you said and said solely i have to tell you something yes so you have to say three things you have to say that in advance so okay first so you tell this okay second oh, okay third <laughs> okay bye that's the man and it was a wonderful experience working with him so, so something today i think it's in very large measure if not entirely because of what i learned at his chambers reflecting back on these experiences what do you think about the system of mentorship right now in the supreme court relationship between the senior bar and the junior bar i think it is uh, pretty good I think there are a lot of seniors who do take juniors. Mr. Venu Gopal takes them. I think Rajiv Dhawan takes them. A lot of the seniors take juniors, and a lot of them, uh, I maybe we get perspective from our perch. I think most of them are pretty good to their juniors, so I think it's uh, working pretty well with the top seniors. Beyond that, I really can't say. So you. Um you became solicitor general at an interesting period uh privatization and uh, slew of other cases could you take us through that period see i became solicitor general in 99 november and the, quite a bit of the landscape had changed and it was a very interesting experience working for 3 years being a chartered accountant and being therefore exposed to the commercial world i had a natural advantage and in fact even solely many times when these kind of cases would come would tell me you know you deal with them because basically he was a constitutional lawyer human rights and stuff like that he knew tax he used to do a lot of tax work and all but for me valuation of shares was pretty easy solely at a mental block with figures <laughs> always does so he always felt more comfortable and he was very accommodating uh, i mean he never had any real ego problems he used to say you deal with these cases So I got a chance to do some of the real initial good work. The anti-dumping came, the first anti-dumping case in Supreme Court I argued. A lot of the advice, background advice for the WTO negotiations. They used to come and run it by me and used to guide them from time to time on how to deal with the WTO. A lot of the challenges to the WTO laws Vandana Shiva and these people brought. I defended for the government. and then of course the first successful privatization the um, balco and it was very interesting having working with a minister like uh, arun shori and pradeep bajal i remember was the secretary and there were arun shori is quite a technocrat himself a man for detail a man for with an eye for figures so while solely argued the legal bits i argued the commercial bits of that case to satisfy the conscience of the court that there was no monkey business in the valuation and how it was done what principles were followed and stuff it was very interesting and you we saw the we had to sort of turn the supreme court around a little from the court of uh, the socialist era to the court of the liberalization era and i think one of the most remarkable changes which the supreme court brought in the law was uh, dealing with contract labor regulation the earlier principle that if you abolished contract labor all the workers automatically became workers flipping it on its head and saying no you can't do anything like that if you abolished contract labor so be it the workers go home so that sort of virtually paved the way for outsourcing 
and that was a remarkable uh, revolution in the law and Supreme Court did that and as Solicitor General I argued the case for the public sector undertakings. So it is very interesting those three years we did a lot of we did the initial work on the competition commission. Mr. Jetley had set up a committee as law minister and then um, the uh, entire electricity reforms were sparked that time and it was a very interesting coincidence how it happened. Of course, they were on the annual 1998 act had already come. Madhya Pradesh government had, Madhya Pradesh board had huge dues to the coal companies. To the point coal companies said we are not going to supply you coal. Mr. Vivek Tankhao, a very clever advocate general, he filed a petition on behalf of the Madhya Pradesh electricity board for a mandamus to the coal companies to supply coal. I was not there, but I am given to understand he quite theatrically had the power switched off when the case was being heard and told the judges this is going to be the order of the day if you don't give me an interim order. And he got a quite a dramatic order from Justice Bhavani Singh saying uh, coal companies will not stop supplies on an undertaking by the electricity board that they will pay as much as they can. <laughs> we brought an appeal to the Supreme Court. Of course, the Supreme Court was red-eyed when they saw the order and said, what is this nonsense? For the coal companies, I moved the matter. But at that time, Mr. Digvijay Singh was chief minister and he came to the government and said, listen, for future, I am willing to make arrangements. But I, when I get the electricity board, I am inheriting a huge baggage of liabilities. Now, if you want me to pay the entire 5,000 crores of the past, I can't because I don't have that kind of money. So why not we find some way that we sort of block the past we find some solution for the past and find way forward for the future. The government then set up a committee under Mr. Monte Aluwalia and I joined that committee, although I was Solicitor General. It was headed by Mr. Aluwalia. Jaram Ramesh was on the committee. And that committee for the first time came up with this report saying that very well, you securitize the past dues and for the future you provide for bank guarantees and stuff. And that then paved the way for reform because then the logical step was that actually you must unbundle and after unbundling and I, I, I very interesting in 2000 I visited Los Angeles and that time Pacific uh, Electric had filed for bankruptcy so I met the lawyers who were dealing with that and they explained how what the problems they were facing and what how the unbundling had happened and so so we came and we worked on that and the World Bank then got into the act and said well very we, we are willing to bankroll losses for a defined period of time if you promise us unbundling and that's how the whole thing happened and then uh, we worked on this draft for quite some time I worked on this draft which ultimately then became the 2003 Electricity Act. Mr. Suresh Prabhu was that time minister and he became a very good friend and we did a lot of work together he was also a chartered accountant okay. so we did a lot of work together and he was one of the finest ministers I've seen very down to earth very straightforward very fine person. You also do a lot of pro bono work, sir. Yeah. Um, what drives you? What motivates you? Pro bono work is very important because a lot of the pro bono work which we do is actually the work which gives our court its identity. Every institution needs an identity. The Supreme Court of India today has, an, has a remarkable identity because all the tremendous work it has done in the field of human rights, tremendous work it has done in the field of environment, and necessarily all this work is not economically rewarding and you always have people who are going to be affected the commercial interests who are going to be affected by this work always can afford good lawyers sometimes they need they equally need good lawyers on the other side to assist them with uh, the counterpoint and that is where the pro bono comes in and justice Varma the one who pulled me into the forest matter pulled me into the air pollution matter and just just get pal and that's when I started doing pro bono work and as a on a personal level I find it immensely satisfying you feel you've done something you've given back in small measure what society has given you in such abundance so on the one hand you are uh, a micas in a slew of cases in a lot of cases on the other hand you represent a lot of corporate interests uh, in India at the moment as a lawyer how do you balance these uh, interests 
what uh, in See, what is the thought process i i have broadly followed one rule anything to do with forests you'll never see me appearing for any private client you will very rarely see me appearing in environmental matters for commercial interests unless i'm personally convinced that what they are saying is right beyond that as lawyers we represent all kinds of clients so there is never one has to see that there is uh, a little uh, divide that things which you do as a cause which you pursue as a passion you don't keep commercial interests out of that so that's important but other than that one uh, you have clients whom you represent in commercial matters and you function as any other lawyer yes i do follow one principle that we do realize that today lawyers are not in public gaze and whether we like it or not the media people like you put us in public gaze and uh, a lot of young lawyers would watch this and they sort of look up to you so you owe it to them that don't do something which sounds like you profess one standard and you practice another standard so there are some cases to which you say no and there are so many cases to which one says no even if a good fee is offered criminal cases for example i'm a little selective of what very selective of what work i take by and large you avoid prevention of corruption act cases where they are gross you avoid certain cases of crime and criminality so another topic a lot of uh, advocates are very loath to talk about which is uh, stardom in a way you're recognized everywhere any every court in india that you go to you're recognized any law school in india every law student recognizes your face you're one of the highest paid lawyers in the world how do you feel about stardom very honestly and comfortable you enjoy it initially but then you realize it casts a huge responsibility on you i have seen the clips on mr jetmalani which you put on your uh, website and see what happens so jetmalani set out to set standards and then he appeared for manu sharma and then you saw the very media which built him up and had so much respect for him went and attacked him relentlessly so it, it's it's an uncomfortable situation to be in and it happened to me in in one case uh, we question was about the spinch valley and i personally felt that that road project had to be allowed to go through and i knew that area spinch uh, as a kid it's it's part of our haunt it's so close to nagpur i knew the minister for uh, roads mr kamalnath who i have known for 40 years personally uh, th- 30 years plus 35 years 40 years almost i have known him my father was his political mentor and so i thought best is he says why don't you come over a cup of coffee we'll resolve it now we sat over it and sorted it out and i said no sorry this we can do this we can't do and i said fine you move this application and i told the court i said i met the minister and this is the suggestion and we have to find a balance between development and environment now and tv channel picked it up and ran a whole story as though sort of i had had a meeting with the minister and done something all in corner so you know all this becomes very uh, everything you do comes in public gaze everything you do you have to then be very careful you have to watch where you go what you do so another question which you are, i think uh, uniquely poised to answer as uh, a micus of the um, the forest bench on the forest bench and uh, the role of the supreme court judicial activism uh, mr venugopal had recently written an article about constraining the role of the supreme court to very selective matters what do you feel about the issue see you cannot have any preconceived notions of what the court should limit itself to it is also very much a a function of the times b it is something which you learn by experience not by mathematical reasoning i do not agree that the supreme court has been over activist has every order passed by the supreme court in every public interest litigation been correct no there have been examples where in my view the court has gone overboard and one example i always give is where the court ordered how the proceedings in the house should be conducted was there provocation for that order yes there was there is grave provocation for today for any court to interfere in where some of the state assemblies are run did the court overboard go overboard yes maybe it crossed the line because now you are getting on to institutional autonomy how would you like if someone 
if the parliament tomorrow said that you know this important case is going on and let it be videographed in supreme court because we want to make sure all the arguments of the government are properly appreciated we won't bear it mm. so i'm not saying every order is right but broadly i don't think our court has really done anything wrong if the court had not relentless, relentlessly enforced the environment law i don't think we would have had any environment left as it is we are in a bad shape today the common allegation is it the supreme court's job to enforce land laws my answer is no it is not why are they doing it because you are not doing it it is the supreme court's duty to see that law is enforced the writ of mandamus is for enforcing law can the supreme court be a mute spectator if there is a rampant corruption which is bringing a crash of the infrastructure of a city i don't think it can be so i don't think there's anything wrong in what justice sabarwal did he took bull by both the hands and he dealt with the problem and possibly we needed a bit of a rap on our knuckles what what do you mean by saying he overdid it i think it is a complete collapse of the planning process it's a complete collapse of the land governance situation in delhi why we find this city is becoming a slum what was one of the most beautiful cities in the country and in the world is becoming a slum now surely the supreme court can't be a mute spectator so i don't agree with all this criticism of judicial activism and the court going beyond its bound thank god the court has gone beyond its traditional bounds and tried to restore some accountability and some order in this country but do you agree sir that the court is uh, overburdened with cases of course it is and all uh, courts in india are overburdened what steps do you th- think need to be taken at the supreme court level supreme court is overburdened because the quality of high courts judgment high court's quality has suffered partly because when you overburden and overwhelm the areas then the quality of your work suffers there is no quick fix to this problem the fundamental problem is the lack of infrastructure let's be very clear about that the number of judges per million is abysmally low i think our average actual occupancy is about 7 8 we are not willing to pay our judges more till you don't pay them more you're not going to get better judges for our government justice delivery system and the criminal justice system is a very low economic priority to me that is a complete distortion of our constitution because you the most important feature of our constitution is rule of law we are a republic because we are a rule of law and you cannot have a rule of law unless you have enforcement of the law and enforcement cannot be without the police and the courts there has to be a dispute resolution system between citizens which is your civil justice system and these are the cornerstones of the rule of law so to put them so low down in priority and believe me every time there is a 1000 2000 3000 crore demand the rumpus which you hear and today in our country 5000 6000 crores is not a large amount by god's kindness we have reached that economic stage that if 10000 crores has to be spent let's spend it but the way the bureaucracy and the civil system goes up in arms every time there is money to be given i mean if the solicitor general assured the court that if 1500 crores is needed for infrastructure such a rumpus and all this uh, uh, news articles about the government chastising the law officers or making commitments why because he said something that he would give for the infrastructure this only shows that we don't want the rule of law in india and the political system doesn't want rule of law to prosper for their own reasons I guess a related question is the quality of legal service in the country and recently the bar council of india has taken has announced quite a few measures to uh, i guess improve the quality of lawyering in the country what further steps do you think you know quality of lawyering in the country suffers at two levels a one is the rush of numbers then nothing you can do about that b second is the quality of legal education what can you do about that you have all sorts of law colleges and all sorts of universities unless you have the kind of powers which are available with the medical council unless you have that kind of a power and create treat law as a serious profession and create those kind of regulatory systems quality of legal education is not going to improve the third is for training of lawyers take take it take in corporate law this nonsense you have about foreign firms not coming in i mean if they come in what do you mean by saying foreign firm they'll come in it will be their name it will be indian lawyers will be working but they will learn the work and the culture of those com- firms which have worked for years and cent- uh, tens of years in those systems they will bring quality to india 
but you want to block them because of few big law firms monopoly will be disturbed so unless all these distortions are taken away in the system we are going to be with this problem so what about uh, life outside the law uh, you mentioned you are a, a jazz uh, aficionado yeah, you play the piano aficionado. sort of i think i do others may disagree and uh, dog i love my dog i love tell us a little bit about them Oh, I have a I was a passionate uh, dog person, and that's why I never got dog because I knew once I get them, I wouldn't stop. My wife broke it by for, first we had a dog, then he died in ninety eight. Then we got another. She got another small dog, four years back. And then there was no stopping us. Okay. So I have my pair, which is my pair of Rottweilers. Yeah. So it's beautiful animals, so loving and yes. scary for others. But What other passions, sir? You could. My well, passion is music, and I'm a total family person. So very private person. I spend time with my family, and summers two months shut shop. Okay. And I'm in London. We have a lot of friends there. Summers in London are becoming a passion. Okay. So something that's uh, that I've very often heard uh, spoken about you is that there is no one like Hari Salve when it comes to court craft or reading the bench. Is there something that you like to tell our young lawyers or law students who might be watching it see we have to understand you're selling an idea you you when you're arguing a case you're putting forth an idea to two human beings so you have to be sensitive at every point of time of what they are hearing not what you are saying so you have to see what they are hearing you have to see what they are thinking you have to bring them around to your point of view p never be dogmatic because if you dog if you turn dogmatic you lose connectivity with the person who's hearing you that person feels he only has his point of view you have to to convince somebody if i'm having a chat with you and if i have to convince you to do something i must bring you around to a common ground if i talk down to you you will hear what i have to say say thank you very much and go and do exactly what you want so if you feel that the judge must shut up and hear you You ever push a judge into that situation? He will shut up and hear you and go and do exactly what he wants, and that's not what you want as a lawyer. So you have to, you have to draw them out and see what they are thinking, see what you are thinking, bring them around to your point of view as far as possible. Sometimes you realize that maybe you've got it wrong, so don't try and be intellectually uh, dogmatic. And that's what this exercise, that's what advo good advocacy is all about. That's what I learned from Mr. Balkiwala. So just a few minutes on um, how you think technology has uh, influenced your legal practice, adoption of certain kinds of technologies. See, I've been a I've been a gizmo kid always, and I've been a passionate uh, this of computers. And uh, just to tell you, we argued the Vodafone case for three weeks in Bombay. I did not, for myself, have a single scrap of paper. my entire brief all the judgments everything was on my apple 17 inch and my notes were on my ipad and everything went so fast and so smooth and so easy so i think technology if we can adapt it for our legal work legal research notes organizing stuff presenting stuff assisting judges to move ahead quickly and saving paper saving the forest it all marries Thank you so much sir. I guess a related question is the quality of legal service in the country and recently the bar council of india has taken has announced quite a few measures to uh, I guess improve the quality of lawyering in the country. What further steps do you think you know quality of lawyering in the country suffers at two levels. A one is the rush of numbers. Then nothing you can do about that. B second is the quality of legal education. What can you do about that? You have all sorts of law colleges and all sorts of universities unless you have the kind of powers which are available with the medical council unless you have that kind of a power and create treat law as a serious profession and create those kind of regulatory systems quality of legal education is not going to improve the third is for training of lawyers take take your take in corporate law this nonsense you have about foreign firms not coming in i mean if they come in what do you mean by saying foreign firm they'll come in it will be their name it will be indian lawyers who will be working 
but they will learn the work and the culture of those com- firms which have worked for years and cent- uh, tens of years in those systems they will bring quality to india but you want to block them because a few big law firms monopoly will be disturbed so unless all these distortions are taken away in the system we are going to be with this problem so what about uh, life outside the law uh, you mentioned you are a, a jazz uh, aficionado yeah, you play the piano aficionado. sort of i think i do others may disagree and uh, dog i love my dog i love tell us a little bit about them oh i have a i was a passionate uh, dog person and that's why i never got dog because i knew once i get them i won't stop my wife broke it by f- first we had a dog then he died in 98 then we got another she got another small dog four years back and then there was no stopping us okay so i have my pair which is my pair of rottweilers yeah. such beautiful animals so loving and scary for others but what are the passions sir you could my passion is music and i am a total family person so very private person i spend time with my family and sabas two months shut shop okay and i am in london we have a lot of friends there sabas in london are becoming a passion okay so something that's uh, that i've very often heard uh, spoken about you is that there is no one like hari salve when it comes to court craft or reading the bench is there something that you like to tell our young lawyers or law students who might be watching it see we have to understand you're selling an idea you you when you're arguing a case you're putting forth an idea to two human beings so you have to be sensitive at every point of time of what they are hearing not what you are saying so you have to see what they are hearing you have to see what they are thinking you have to bring them around to your point of view p never be dogmatic because if you dog if you turn dogmatic you lose connectivity with the person who's hearing you that person feels he only has his point of view you have to to convince somebody if i'm having a chat with you and if i have to convince you to do something i must bring you around to a common ground if i talk down to you you will hear what i have to say say thank you very much and go and do exactly what you want so if you feel that the judge must shut up and hear you you ever push a judge into that situation he will shut up and hear you and go and do exactly what he wants and that's not what you want as a lawyer so you have to you have to draw them out and see what they are thinking see what you are thinking bring them around to your point of view as far as possible sometimes you realize that maybe you've got it wrong so don't try and be intellectually uh, dogmatic and that's what this exercise that's what advo- good advocacy is all about that's what i learned from mr balkiwala so just a few minutes on um, how you think technology has uh, influenced your legal practice adoption of certain kinds of technologies see i've been a i've been a gizmo kid always and i've been a passionate uh, this of computers and uh, just to tell you we argued the vodafone case for 3 weeks in mumbai i did not for myself have a single scrap of paper my entire brief all the judgments everything was on my apple 17 inch and my notes were on my ipad and everything went so fast and so smooth and so easy so i think technology if we can adapt it for our legal work legal research notes organizing stuff presenting stuff assisting judges to move ahead quickly and saving paper saving the forest it all marries like your verdict give us the answer